in a way, like podcasting has been around for like many, many years. I mean, it's been around for basically a hundred years, mm-hmm. if you think about it, because it's not that different sure. than sitting around and listening to a radio show. Is this particular iteration of the medium around to stay for a while? I think that I don't know that there is a particular iteration of it right now. Yeah. I think that it's that it's people are trying a lot of things in podcasting right now and that's what's kind of exciting. Like my company Pineapple Street makes like we make money in a completely different way than like Gimlet does and we make a totally different product than Gimlet does. And there are interview podcasts and there are short series that are blowing up and turning into TV series and film and there are just a million different kinds of podcasts and a lot of them are doing quite well right now. What's different in terms of your monetization versus a Gimlet? We didn't take any money, any venture capital. That was a big difference. They really did take sort of the startup approach. Well, obviously they had a podcast called Startup. Yeah. I mean, and Gimlet's amazing. They do a lot of great stuff, but we didn't want to take money. We wanted to decide what we were going to do and not have it always be the thing that made the most sense in a way. Like I think when you take venture capital, I imagine that you have to do the thing that's going to make the most money quickly. Yeah, or even more than that, you're essentially beholden to the people who are offering you money up front. Yes, exactly. And right now our board is me and my co-founder and that's, you know, we make all the decisions. (laughs) I really like that. We had to make money in a different way because we had to make money immediately. And, you know, if you take venture capital, you don't have to make money immediately because you took it. (laughs) You have to, and then you have kind of like a while to figure out how you're actually going to make money. So we have a model where we take production fees up front. So we're not, we're not trying to build a network with like sponsorships and commercials and that sort of thing. I'm going to sit over here if you don't mind. Sure. I'll just see. That's see, now it's going to be, yeah. Because you're going to hear that yeah, squeak. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll edit it out. <laughs> Does do you it, want me to keep the part you where you say this? I'm going to? Yeah. Oh, you do it yourself? Oh, yeah. I got in from uh, Spain at like 11 p.m. last night and I was oh just gosh. editing on the plane for the duration. You know what I did last night? Probably something more fun than I, <laughs> what I did. I did something more fun than what I usually do. Okay. I saw Bruce Springsteen on Broadway. It was the most amazing thing ever. My mind was like totally blown already. And then at the end, he starts like pointing up to the box seat right above me and making prayer hands. And it's fucking Barack Obama. (laughs) And then they're just like pointing back and forth to each other and being like, you're the man. No, you're the man. And that was my night. Yeah. Well, to be fair, they're both the man. They're both the man. They were both right in that instance. (laughs) They're really really both the man. You've been in a room with uh, Hillary Clinton. That's true. Before. So she's a doll. Are these sorts of things still <laughs> surreal to you? Barack Obama is like my my yeah. god kind of. Yeah. I really love Barack Obama. <laughs> and he looked like he was ten feet tall and glowing. That was like I don't get starstruck that much. I think I always imagine that if I see Sarah Jessica Parker, I'll be starstruck. I think it's just like a sex in the city, like New York. Just like she I feel like I need to see her. So your two people are Barack Obama <laughs> and Sarah Jessica Parker? Yeah. yeah, but then I'm pretty like chill with a lot of... Hillary Clinton, though. That must have yeah. been something. Hillary Clinton is like... When you see Hillary Clinton for the first time, you just feel like you're seeing a family member. She's like been in our lives sure. for so long that like I just felt like I was like, oh, it's like Aunt Hillary. Yeah. You know? Like, good to see you. Like, I, I didn't actually feel any... It wasn't like the like you know like fame excitement thing i was just like oh hi missed you did she seem very business-like no she's like she's so just like sweet and charming and great i think issue's always been that she's i think she's just like really great with people in small groups and i don't know that she's that interested in talking to you know thousands of people from a state sure being good with people in a room of two people doesn't necessarily translate to these sorts (laughs) of rallies but that's why we wanted to make a hillary clinton podcast which was my company's it ended up being my company's first podcast and it was basically we were like she really translates well she's really good at just talking one-on-one to people and making you feel like you're the only person there and you're the only person that she's thinking about right then and she's very good with like with one-on-one stuff so we were kind of like she should have a podcast because that's what a podcast does is it sort of i think it like creates an intimate space you got that impression from her prior to meeting her and you just thought yeah it would be i just venue? totally i mean if you hear her in like interviews with one person i mean yeah she's kind of i think like she can be sort of shy but she sounds her most real when she's talking to small groups of people and i think like what people wanted from her obviously during the campaign was that they wanted her to feel real to them and like a real person and not like an overly edited person. When we were starting the company, we sort of made it a goal 
to have people say no to us. <laughs> it's a good goal, actually. I recommend it to young entrepreneurs. What do you mean by that? <laughs> we wanted to try to do things that were so outlandish that okay. like, we were sure that people were going to say no. Because we wanted to just try a lot of new things with podcasting. Yeah. I was like, what if we just like see if Hillary Clinton wants a campaign podcast? Like, sh I'm sure she's not very busy. <laughs> she must have time to make a podcast, which was a crazy idea. And so we emailed her team and then basically like in less than a month we had a podcast like up an episode up which was crazy they were like actually we've been thinking about this ourselves why don't you come in and then they really liked my co-founder max linsky who's awesome and they were like why doesn't he, why don't we do a show that's max and hillary just like hanging out and talking to each other so that's what we did i mean i wonder how much of our lack of success and experience in life is just assuming that people aren't going to do something of just not even asking those not questions. asking yeah i think that that's <laughs> that's what leaning in is <laughs> it was a book i read and it did help me you read buzzfeed prior to that yeah and you just decided let me do the craziest thing and start a podcasting network yeah well it wasn't really like that i'm actually the opposite okay. of like doing crazy things Cause, i'm cause very... I, I was reading i think it was like a fast company interview you did <laughs> yeah and it was just like yeah and then she had a kid and started a, a network and i'm just like why would you do both i know of those it was at the same time it was insane but it, i did have i had confidence that i could do it but actually I never, ever wanted to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I never, like, I was not at all interested in owning my own company. It it got to a point where, like, it felt like I had to do it or, or just be really stupid. When I was at BuzzFeed, the, the cool thing about being there was that they sort of just let me do whatever I wanted. I mean, that sounds like the ideal experience for any creative person to, yeah. to do whatever you want and then have the resources of a large company behind you. It is, but it also isn't because... I had never been at an at a company that wasn't audio first mm. before. BuzzFeed was my first like company where they were like, "We don't know how to do this. You help us figure it out." And so I did. I think I did a really good job. Like we had hit shows. We did another round. We did like Lena Dunham's show, yep. and they were shows that had huge audiences and did really well. But BuzzFeed was kind of like I would be like, "It's amazing. We got two hundred thousand listeners," and they would be like. This fucking video just got 20 million views. Like, why do we care about 200,000? So I think they didn't really, like, get the magic of podcasts. And they didn't really, like, understand that, like, people engage in podcasts so much more deeply than they do with, like, a video. You know, a video, you see it for, like, a minute and then it's gone. But a podcast, like, it takes an effort to download it. And you really have to, like, you're really, like, seeking it out. And you become part of this, like, rabid fan community it's a whole thing and so i think that deep engagement was actually something that was really good for the company mm -hmm. um, and they ended up understanding that for sure but the good thing that happened at buzzfeed was that because no one there had done audio i really had to figure out everything so i was like doing legal contracts and finding ads and sponsors and i was also producing all the shows and um, coming up with the ideas and having people try out for podcasts and trying lots of different things. So I was, I was doing all, you know, legal, financial and creative. And it was basically like running my own business mm -hmm. within a business. And I kept hearing from people outside of BuzzFeed who really wanted to start podcasts. So it was like a really random assortment. Like I, this was years ago, but like I went to Ivanka Trump's office. This oh, was before. What has she been up to lately? The last <laughs> I, couple of years. Yeah, so you I haven't heard know. much from her. I haven't really heard anything about her. She should have had a podcast. <laughs> she could have stayed relevant. <laughs> maybe um, we wouldn't be where we are now. <laughs> maybe we if... wouldn't. The, so I like, I just went into their office yeah. and talked to them about a podcast and then Lena Dunham was a friend of mine from from college who I'd known forever and she wanted to do another season of her show but she didn't want to do it at BuzzFeed so that happened and then like this Hillary Clinton stuff happened we heard from a friend at, I heard from or Max my business partner heard from a friend at Wyden Kennedy who wanted to do some branded shows and he heard from people at the New York Times that they wanted to start podcasts this was before the daily so you were getting all of these so offers we were getting, while you were at BuzzFeed yeah we were getting all this interesting all these interesting people coming to us being like, we don't know how to do this. And I think the way that we're different than like a Gimlet or really kind of anywhere is that we offer basically like production services to yeah. these places and we partner on everything we do. So is it like being for hire in a sense? Yeah, it's like being for hire. And I think it's at a point now where people know that they know that we do very quality work. And mm -hmm. so 
it's more a partnership than just like a production for hire. Now we're working on deals where we are part owners of things, but at first we were just, yeah, we were production for hire and that's how we figured out, that's how we managed to bring in a bunch of money quickly so that we didn't have to take mm-hmm. venture capital um, so that we could have basically like a, a like we, we made our seed money by taking money up front for doing production and all of our deals are different. So with Lena Dunham, we did like a 50 50 split on the ad sales and we went and found the ads and then we split the money 50 50 and a lot of places will just give us a production fee. Some places give us a smaller production fee and an ownership stake. So we wanted to just have a company that was like open to lots of different things and ways of being. And I think like our main thing is that we we see how quickly podcasting as an industry is changing and we want to change with it. We don't want to pretend that we have all the answers to anything. We're doing vastly different stuff now than we were when we first started and really vastly different than anything we imagined we'd be doing at this point. What are the big differences between when you started in terms of content? Yeah, so when we started, a lot of what we were doing was these... We thought we'd be doing like basically like chat shows for magazines. Mm. So, you know, go into like New York Magazine and get Rembert. He's not there anymore, but, you know, get somebody at New York Magazine to host a show that sort of was branded like, weekly content. Yeah, it, that was like pre- it, pretty simple to make and that we would, you know, help them figure it out and make those shows. But then we made this show called Missing Richard Simmons, which did very well. <laughs> and. Well, it was very controversial. Some people think <laughs> that we're evil for making it, but I don't. But it also opened a lot of doors for us because I think it showed that we could do these kind of like sweeping narrative series. And so that has been really exciting because a lot of what we're doing now is we're working directly with like Hollywood studios to make big productions that either they own or we co-own. And the goal is to turn them into something else eventually. But it also means that we're basically making money by like creating ip for people and we get to do like this just amazing stuff like right now we're working on this like really intense series where we're following a woman through her death and it's going to be probably like four episodes and it's really deep and wild and sad and beautiful but that's like not making a chat show for a magazine (laughs) that's really different and i think like most of what we're going to be doing this year is these kind of big sweeping series we did this podcast called heaven's gate about the cult heaven's gate that was 10 episodes and it was also like a big narrative reported series and like that's kind of the dream i think like most people making podcasts like you want to try to like craft something kind of beautiful (laughs) and compelling and interesting and i also like I really like not having to do the same thing every week. I think our employees really do too. Our producers are excited that like they get to make six episodes of something amazing that feels like artistically exciting to them. And then, you know, maybe they'll take a break and do like a branded show for a couple months and then we'll go back to a huge series that's on a completely different topic. So we're just trying to do a bunch of interesting things, but I think less and less, We're I, I think we won't be doing any chat shows pretty soon. I think it's one of the underrated elements of, of the medium is the ability to do something for a short period of time, to do a mini series. I mean, certainly yeah. you can't really do that on television. You can't do it on other mediums in the same way that you can in podcasting, just sort of get in and out. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think like Netflix has been trying to do some things and that's what I love watching. I was actually really disappointed when Handmaid's Tale was like re-upped for a second season because I was like, wait, this is a mini series. Yeah. I want it to like, I want it to end. I don't want it to drag on forever. It was a book. I know what happens in the book. Like, You, you might be in the minority <laughs> on that. I think like most people in the world are just like, I enjoy this thing. I want it to last forever. No, if I really enjoy something, I, I want it to like have an ending. <laughs> you want it to be sort of a, just a, a perfect self-contained thing. Totally, because you see what happens with things like this. It's like, it just... They want, They just have to suddenly create more and more content, and that doesn't mean it's going to be better and better. Yeah. I think it's actually like a really amazing thing when people are given the opportunity to like continue something and they say no. I like people who decide when their TV shows are going to end. For example, like Lena Dunham decided she was going to do six seasons of Girls. She's controversial, whether you like her or not. I thought that was kind of cool that she she really like made the decision. She's like, okay, I don't want to drag this on forever. These are real these characters mean a lot to me and i want their journey to end somewhere and i'm like excited that i'm excited that we're going to be able to to do that stuff these like finite series do you feel like part of your job has become being a a storyteller um 
I always sort of like make fun of the word storyteller. It's just well, a, in that in that you are telling stories. I know, but you are it just a teller sounds, of stories. It's so pretentious. Sure, but what I mean, you, you know, there's definitely a change in job description between editor to really sort of crafting a true. narrative over a certain you know number of episodes. Yeah, and I'm not the main person doing that. Mm. Honestly, like we've hired really gifted producers to make this stuff. The main way that my job has changed actually is it's like I'm doing less creative stuff than i used to do and more business are you and happy i love the business oh stuff. really it's so fun i yeah. really didn't know it was gonna be like this like my my friend max and i started this and he you know he had hosted one podcast the long form podcast but he hadn't like made any podcast so we were kind of like okay he's gonna do the business i'll do the creative but it turns out like he's a great producer i really love figuring out money and like projections and <laughs> you know, investing and all that crazy stuff. So you could be a lot richer than you are with, with that, that particular <laughs> set of skills, but yet you've chosen the podcasting route. There's some money in podcasting. <laughs> there, I mean, it's all there, relative. There, you know, yeah. you can walk a couple blocks down to Wall Street. It's, I mean, yes, I could, but then I would hate myself. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been fun. I really like, I really enjoy the business stuff. Yeah. I like looking at spreadsheets and figuring out what money is going to come in from where. I'm still sending out invoices, which is really like, not a great look mm. if you're like the head of a company to be the person who's like where's my money <laughs> so i'm gonna set up a fake email account that um is just like finance at pineapple <laughs> i mean i wonder how important that element is when out of the gate your first host is hillary clinton i suspect that you don't have a problem getting people to take you seriously that was amazing i mean yeah. our, it sort of just randomly ended up this way our first hosts were hillary clinton then Lena Dunham, the New York Times, specifically Wesley Morris and Jenna Wortham, a show called Still Processing. That's a fun like culture show we do for the Times and Wyden Kennedy. So it was like the presidential candidate, very famous actress, like these amazing culture writers at like the best newspaper and like the biggest ad firm. This is why I say like, I didn't want to do this, but it would have been fucking stupid yeah. to have those four like clients and be like, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I'm going to send you. And I don't have a place to send you because nobody does like production services, basically. Does that potentially ruin everything that comes after when your first host is <laughs> Hillary Clinton? Like, where do you go from there? Hillary Clinton, it, it was exciting and fun. Yeah. But but also like making Missing Richard Simmons was yeah. incredible. It's like you're following a story and like you're reporting and you're working with a host who's never done this but who's incredible at it and that to me is it's all exciting but hillary clinton versus dan taberski who's the host of missing richard simmons yeah she's more famous and well known but like both of those shows are really exciting for yeah. different reasons i mean it's just really really fun getting you know pop into like west hollywood and stand outside richard simmons house and hope he's gonna come down and send him love letters and <laughs> it's crazy shit well you alluded to the the controversy was it clear to you that it was going to be a controversial topic from the beginning i don't think so i think it was interesting because it was like the show the show started out with us being the like clear underdogs mm -hmm. you know we were like just like a couple like dorks looking for Richard Simmons <laughs> and it, like one you know very like powerful billionaire basically then we slowly realized with all the media attention it was getting that like we were no longer the underdogs and mm. we couldn't we couldn't act like the underdogs anymore and I think it's kind of been like a thing that's happened at Pineapple too it's like we were just like this like small dinky company that ended up getting lucky and doing some good work and and we now have to like think of ourselves as like in the big leagues. I've been buying uh, adult clothes for the first time. I just had two suit jackets made because I can't, I can't like keep, I can't keep pretending I'm like this underdog child. I, it's like we're doing well and we have to own that. There's certainly some certain appeal to being in in that position. And maybe you know, we were talking about my like very elementary setup, and and there's something to be said for that I, are, are you more comfortable though than now that you're in the position of being a professional i mean i'm getting there yeah it's weird to like it's not your default mode <laughs> adulting yeah. or whatever yeah or, or just you know again like you said there's there are certain things that you can do mm -hmm. when you don't know that it's going to be a phenomenon you know there are certain there are certain risks that you can take totally. when you're smaller yeah but then there are certain risks you can take when you're bigger yeah. too and i think like we We've tried to really stick by our values. I worked at enough places that like paid me shit money that made it made me want to like pay my employees well. Like yeah. we pay we pay people really well. We give them really good benefits, good vacation time. Like we want to 
want to make sure that they're really happy. And that's something that like, no matter how big we get, I think we always want to prioritize that. So even with growth, we have these values that are important to us. And one of them is really taking risks and trying crazy stuff. So we're about to make some like really like kind of big wild announcements and they're things that like might totally fail, but we want to always try to do the thing that we think might fail. But when you get to a certain point and when you have not only your family to support, but also these employees in this business, I mean, do you feel that it's necessary to make certain decisions for the sake of Definitely. staying afloat? And oh, yeah, totally. Being successful. Yeah. I mean, we have we have like a big branded wing that yeah. is like a big part of what we do. We're making three shows right now for Morgan Stanley and I'm having fun with it. <laughs> like yeah. it's all part of the business, I think. And I think our employees really understand I don't want to keep calling them employees. I don't know why I'm saying that. They're my crew. I Your think coworkers. Like, yeah, our my our coworkers, they understand that in order to keep this place yeah. afloat, there are these things that we're going to do. We're never going to do things that we feel really terrible about. Like we have a lot of fun with the people at Morgan Stanley. You had to have some serious conversations about whether Morgan Stanley was going to be a good partner for you. What makes a good partner for us is like we've like stopped working with people who are who like by all accounts would sound like great partners. Mm-hmm. Because we haven't had the personality click that we wanted. For us, what makes a great partner is just somebody who like really wants to do this. A lot of people come to us and they're like, we feel like we should have a podcast. We don't really know why. Like, can you help us figure it out? And we can help them to an an extent, but we always, we've told a lot of people that they shouldn't have podcasts, actually. It's like, (laughs) which like maybe is bad for business, but I think like, I want to be honest with people. I don't think that like a magazine needs to have like 10 crappy podcasts. I think that if they want to do anything, they should do like one amazing series that everyone's talking about. Why does Morgan Stanley need a podcast? (laughs) I think that it's like an interesting and new way for them to like get their message out. They sponsor NPR, so they've been able to promote the show on Mm -hmm. NPR. So a lot of people actually listen to it and we try to make it really good. And they've been very open to like our ideas and just like good to work with and i think our staff really gets it and we talk about it a lot but we're going to do things that pay well and that we feel okay about i'm not going to do a monsanto show we're mm-hmm. not going to do right wing shows like we're that's another like value i think is like we've we're pretty like openly leftist when the nra comes to you and <laughs> we, yeah the nra could pay our bills for five years and we wouldn't yeah. we would not ever do their podcast so our staff knows that like we have these values in what we do and that when we're doing branded shows it's because we feel like there's good potential for them to be good shows and that we like the partners that we're working with and they also get that that is what's going to fund a podcast that's like four episodes about a woman's death that like we don't know who's gonna pay for that or what the hell you know so like or you know that might be the least commercial idea i've heard for totally yes i know like do you want casper mattress like she's we're literally like her deathbed her literal deathbed no we are like literally at her deathbed right now like imagine a fucking casper ad popping up it's not gonna work and like and they all share in it we also it's been important to us that we don't have a branded division all the other podcast companies they separate it they're like this is like editorial Hmm. and this is branded and we don't do that because we think that everybody should share in it and that like we don't want to give somebody one person like the job of making every branded show when you're an editorial it's important to set those walls right Mm -hmm. it's important to have some buffer between you and sales it's important to have some buffer between you and branded content you don't want people to think there's bleed over totally yeah and i think that we we've never like we've never pretended to be like a news organization Mm. and i worked in news organizations for years like i worked in public radio for many years and at buzzfeed and it was so important for me and for those places to have this like really strict line between those things and i totally get that but what we're doing is like we're producers so if i'm making one show about like somebody's death and another show that promotes a bank those things can actually work together in a way and i'm not and that was actually a big thing that happened with the hillary clinton show is we got some press criticism because people were like oh like this is like interviews with hillary clinton but like it's just a it's just political propaganda Mm. and we're like yeah we're being paid by the clinton campaign like we're not pretending that this is anything but something that we want to do to help hillary clinton win you know like i don't but also we're working with a candidate that we support totally yeah and we were we were 
completely open about that. Yeah. So I thought it was a little bit crazy when people were like, oh, like they're, you know, they pretend that it's like newsy, but it's really just, it's like, yeah, she's paying us to do this. Mm-hmm. And like, and we really want Donald Trump to lose and we really want her to win. And we're, we have no, we're not secretive about that. So, yeah. So I think it's, it's been kind of, it's actually been like kind of really nice in a way to like, not be at a news organization. I mean, I I loved being at news organizations, but I've felt like very free to be like, oh, like we're going to do this because like I want Hillary Clinton to win. And I can say that to everybody now. <laughs> like I didn't used to, I used to, you know, like I didn't even, I couldn't post like anything political on yeah. Facebook even. And then I'm like, oh, cool. My first show is like a Hillary Clinton, like propaganda <laughs> podcast. Again, my primary job is writing about technology mm-hmm. and I'm, often feel bad that, you know, am I propagating the cycle of people upgrading their phones every year and, and the world is falling apart around me? What can I actually do? And you've yeah. put yourself in a position where you're able to, I mean, it sounds like it's both creatively fulfilling and also when the moment comes, you're able to actually, I don't want to say affect change, but actually feel like you've done something. Yeah. And that's like, that's important to me. I always wanted to either like work in like homeless services or make podcasts. All right. <laughs> like I, I, like I want to, I want to like do things that feel so like. You pick the one that pays slightly better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> only slightly. But I want to like do things that feel like they're making a difference. And I think like yeah. at BuzzFeed, like we made kind of like the first like highly produced black female podcast. Like that's, and that was like a, I really wanted to do that. Like that was a priority. Like I didn't didn't want to do the shit that was like everything else out there and i think at pineapple too like i think that like every single host we've had is either is a person of color or a queer person or a woman and that is not what podcasting has traditionally been and it's not who the audience has traditionally been either like the podcast audience is still pretty overwhelmingly like white guys in their 30s and 40s but i mean that's changing a lot and i think i always want to like work on things that change that audience and take risks and that sort of thing it seems like it has the opportunity to to change faster than other mediums again because the barrier of entry is relatively low i mean in a sense Mm -hmm. they're not all going to be good but everyone can have a podcast totally the barrier yeah the barrier to entry is is low I don't want people to think it's that low because there are a lot of crappy podcasts I out there. I think there's anything wrong with that. Editing I mean, is very important. Sure. God bless them. There's crappy podcasts. Do you think that's going to negatively impact the ones at the top if there's a lot of things for people to wade through in order to get to the good ones? I do think that there isn't a great mechanism currently sure. for like discoverability and that I hope that somebody tries to jump in and fix that. But I mean, yeah, I don't think it hurts. There are, there are over 400,000 podcasts yeah. on iTunes, which is wacky right now. And that's about two per listener of podcasts. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and only one percent, less than one percent supposedly make money, yeah. which is interesting. That was one of the funny things about that conversation that you were having on stage half an hour ago is, oh, yeah, you know, I started and I started another one. I mean, you can't just yeah. on a whim when yeah, there's a person it's you want to talk to. I think another cool thing about podcasts is that they're sort of the least trolled medium. So I think a lot of people who don't necessarily feel safe on like Twitter and yeah. writing articles and making videos feel a lot safer with podcasts and that's because it takes such an effort to like listen for like you know if you're listening to a podcast for an hour you're like engaging deeply in it the reason that people troll people is because they're not actually like really listening to what they're saying they're seeing like a you know a very like short tweet and being like fuck you i hate you and with a podcast you like you you're listening to somebody explain their position for an hour and it's really hard to hate them and it's also like if you really like hate someone and want to troll them why would you ever listen to them for multiple hours talk about their opinions there was a model for the music industry for a really long time we've been going through a transition for a while same in publishing actually whether we're moving towards something or whether we're always just going to be in constant din how did you think your approach was different or what did you think you were able to offer some of these high profile people yeah, I think that our that our model is different because we don't need to own everything we do. And that's a big deal. Like um You're not precious about it. We're not precious about it. And I get why you would be. Like I get why people want to own their intellectual property. It makes it makes you more valuable as a company. Um and we're definitely moving toward more and more ownership, but I think that we also are just like 
we my like priority is really like to have fun and do things that we feel psyched about and hillary clinton we weren't gonna own hillary clinton's content <laughs> like we wanted and we wanted to do that sorry hillary <laughs> yeah and like lena dunham we weren't gonna own her stuff yeah. either and we've just we've gotten so many amazing opportunities by like allowing other people to either share in the ownership or take ownership of things and that was a completely new model and i'm really glad we did things that way there you go. That was Jenna Weiss Berman. She is the co-founder of Pineapple Street Media. You can check out their shows at pineapple.fm. Recorded that one at the On Air Festival in Brooklyn a few months back. I hope you enjoy that very, very wonky podcasting conversation as much as I did. Thanks so much to her for taking the time to do that. Thanks to Meryl for helping set up that conversation. Thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the program. If you like the show, there are a number of ways to support us. You can rate and review us on iTunes or Google Podcasts now or wherever you happen to get your podcasts. Like us on Facebook. If you've got any feedback, it's rwellcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Tumblr. That's rwellcast.tumblr.com. And that is the first and best place to get all of your RIYL related information. And that's about it for this week. So stick around because we will be back just about this time next week with another episode of RIYL.